Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a return guest this week. Dare I say he was one of my favorite guests. Uh, He is an international master, a well-known and acclaimed author. He is a consultant for the World Chess Hall of Fame. He works on the Sanford Sanford Fellowship Committee. Um, He is recently retired, which we will discuss, as um, director of the Mechanics Institute. And we will consider this part two, two and a half years from our first interview. So first of all, if you haven't heard that one, you should definitely go listen. But we've, we've got a lot to catch up on and a lot we didn't even get to the first time. So I am John Donaldson. Thanks for coming back on Perpetual Chess. Well, thank you for having me, Ben. So how is, uh, we were just discussing briefly before we started recording, it sounds like uh, retirement is not as leisurely as you might have expected. Uh, no, I, I, initially I, I envisioned it as a chance to uh, start studying again and playing again. I seems like, uh, like 20 years ago since I last had the opportunity to really uh, uh, do both. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it turns out that with uh, uh, retirement uh, comes the possibility to uh, travel more and, and various projects. And I'm trying, still trying to uh, finish the uh, uh uh, the print version of the uh, Fisher series, and uh, right now I'm at the stage where I'm just uh, uh, doing rewriting, and I, I hope to have the uh, the biographical part, which was uh, parts four and five of the ebook series, uh, out you know sometime either at the end of this year or early next year. Excellent, coming right up. So, will there be different material, or are you just sort of uh, combining it all, or what's different for the print version as compared to the the e and Kindle versions? Uh, it'll it'll be they'll be quite different. Uh, at least the uh, the last two sections of the ebook, uh, which dealt with uh, more biographical material, uh, I've learned a great deal uh, in the last year and a half. In part because the World uh, Chess Hall of Fame has acquired. Uh, Part of the archive of uh, William Lombardi, and they've uh, uh, they had collected the materials on loan from the U.S. Chess Federation on uh, Jerry Spann, an old USCF president, and there's just a lot of uh, uh, letters uh, back and forth that gave more insights into his life. And also, uh, one thing with the ebook series will be different is that uh, I had a lot of photos in there that were taken by uh, Beth Cassidy. She was a uh, photographer for Chess Life in the, uh, and I should say for Chess Life and Chess, Chess Review in the mid-1960s, and she uh, took wonderful black and white photos, but uh, she only saved the slides, and a friend of mine, uh, the late Frank Berry, he scanned all those slides about a decade ago, but uh, when he uh, did that, you know, it was a time when uh, uh, you know, higher resolution scanning wasn't so readily available, and as a result, uh, a lot of those photos, which really turn out nice in the ebooks, and there's like you know dozens and dozens of them. Unfortunately, they don't really work for a print book. They're just not of a sufficiently high resolution. Uh, so there'll be quite a lot. I, I would say that uh, for the first three volumes in the uh, the series, which deal with uh, uh, Fisher's writings, with Fisher's uh, uh, tour in 64 greatly expanded over Legend on the Road and with uh, the third which deals with all of Fisher's other exhibitions that he gave including the, the month long tour in Argentina in 1970 uh, those will be very similar although there will still be some added material but the last two volumes which are which are the ones that I'm working on right now uh, which will be one print book uh, they're still uh, uh, you know I mean, I, just to give you a, a couple examples, uh, one is that uh, uh, there's a book uh, from Iceland that uh, was just recently translated into English, uh, and I, I beg uh, forgiveness, I can't pronounce the gentleman's last name, but in there he mentions that uh, uh, William Lombardi and Bobby Fischer uh, reconciled, and uh, probably many of your viewers know that 
uh, after Lombardi wrote the article that appeared in Sports Illustrated in 1974 about the uh, Fisher Spassky match from an insider's point of view, uh, Bobby just cut him off and would have nothing to do with him. And in fact, in 1978 at the uh, U.S. Championship in Pasadena, there was a very uh, unfortunate incident where uh, Lombardi ran into Fisher uh, at a uh, grocery store in Pasadena and uh, Lombardi kind of reached out, you know, he'd been a lifelong friend and, uh, and Fisher just cut him off. It's like, I don't want to have anything to do with you. You know, you know, you know, we weren't supposed to do that. But, um, uh, in 2005, when Fisher returned to, uh, Iceland and, and perhaps even earlier, uh, he, uh, and, uh, Lombardi had reconciled and, uh, they had many conversations, uh, uh, for the, you know, for the remainder of, of Fisher's life, which was unfortunately not that long. Uh, so that was one thing I had not realized. I thought that Fisher and Lombardi had basically, after that article appeared in Sports Illustrated in 74, that they had, you know, had no further communication. So that's like a, a nice development. Another thing I learned uh, just recently, the World Chess Hall of Fame, uh, uh, as I mentioned, got the uh, uh, archive from Lombardi, uh, which sadly to say, uh, in, in so many ways he mirrored Fisher. And in his case, uh, just like Fisher ha uh, failed to keep up the payments on his storage locker uh, with all of his treasures in it, so uh, Lombardi did. And uh, these items have been, you know, being sold on on eBay for like the last year and a half. But the World Chess Hall of Fame was able to acquire a lot of them and rescue them. And amongst those items they saved was a letter from uh, uh, Anthony Sadie uh, to uh, Lombardi. And in that letter, uh, he mentioned to Lombardi, who was trying to, this letter, by the way, is from 1977. He was trying to make peace with uh, Lombardi, with uh, Fisher, and get, you know, back in contact with him. And he was hoping to use Sadie as the go-between. And uh, so they discussed that a little bit in the, uh, the, the letter by Sadie. But Sadie also mentioned that he had a long conversation with Fisher about blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, he's like, well, blood transfusions? And Fisher's, like, adamantly against them. Like, and Sadie's like, under any conditions? Like, you know, you're, like, bleeding out, like, from some fatal wound? And uh, under any conditions, you can't have a blood transfusion, Fisher said. And, well, he wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, so I don't know where that strong conviction came from. But when you line up all of his, uh, uh, the incidents in his life from, the early 1960s when he uh, had appendicitis in Yugoslavia and uh, refused to have surgery and, you know, it was saved by antibiotics uh, to uh, uh, this incident with, you know, the question of the blood transfusions. And, of course, you know, later on in his life, uh, we all know, I mean, you know, that kidney disease that he died from was, was treatable, but he refused uh, uh, any sort of uh, medical intervention, and I don't know why he had the views he did. I mean, his his mother was a nurse, later a doctor, so uh, it wasn't like he was from a family that had no education, uh, hardly. Uh, but those are two two recent things I just picked up. Oh, interesting. And I'm sorry to cut you off. I was just going to, I know that last time we spoke, you mentioned that you had seen uh, William Lombardi um, briefly before he passed. So if you, I guess if you'd known then what you know now, you could have uh, tried to extract a few more details, although I don't know if he would have shared them. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, of course, uh, the last uh, six weeks of his life he spent in the Bay Area. Uh, he was a regular at the Mechanics Institute. Uh, he, he seemed to have a really good time when he was there, uh, you know, uh, all the mechanics members really enjoyed having him. People were taking him out for lunch. I mean, people, chess players from uh, Europe would come into the uh, mechanics and they'd see the, the famous William Lombardi and they would want to play him a couple of blitz games and they would pay him nicely for that. And uh, uh, it was it was very nice to see him get some of the recognition that, you know, he was due. Uh, but uh, I wonder, you know, he also had medical uh, uh, issues earlier in the year. He, he, I believe he was hospitalized in, uh, New York for, uh, uh, heart related issues. And one wonders also about him, you know, that, uh, you know, probably they, 
they wanted him not to uh, have such a uh, active uh, uh, lifestyle that he did. You know, I mean, he 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 was pretty fearless, even despite all of his uh, uh, physical challenges. But I mean, I think he might have known that he didn't have that long, and he, you know, you you know, he wanted to enjoy himself and instead of being, you know, hospitalized and eke out a couple extra months. He just wanted to 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 have some adventures. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, so, so we're hoping to get this Fisher book out in in late December. Uh, do you feel like do you feel like um, your research is coming to a natural conclusion, or <laughs> is it more just that uh, it's time to publish the book? You know, it's uh, uh, I think it's a, a a bit of both. Although, having said that, I don't know if 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 everybody noticed, but. Uh, uh, recently, all the games from one of uh, Fisher's uh, Simuls in Germany was uh, from 1970, I believe it's from Munster. Uh, they were published on a chess base, but not the English version, but the uh, German language version. It was probably a couple weeks ago. Uh, so thing, and there was like, like maybe like 15 or 17 new games. I mean, I can't say they were all great brilliancies, but they were interesting. Uh, so things keep popping up. Hmm. That, that's interesting. So have you meant you mentioned you're thinking, or at least we're considering uh, coming back to competing in chess? Have you made? Have you managed to crack open the books at all? Um, any? Or is that just uh, fallen by the wayside for the moment? You know, it's been sort of a double edged sword. I, I have played a couple tournaments this year and and, and, and with reasonable results, uh, considering all the rust. But uh, I, I don't want to get too tempted to do too much study now because I still need to finish these books first. I'm the sort of person that I can't like juggle like a, a whole bunch of balls at the same time. It's it's easier for me, especially with a big project, just to focus in on it. And I just need to do it for like the next month or two, and, and then 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 I can switch over to, to playing mode. That makes sense. And is uh your co-author Eric Tangborn? Is he still collaborating? Um... Yes, he is. Okay. He is. He uh, he's uh, uh, you know a lifelong friend of mine from the Tacoma Chess Club, fellow international master, and uh, a fellow you know like myself. He started playing because of Bobby. Okay. Well, John. I mean, obviously, we love your books and uh, eager eager to to get the print version and and read everything, all the new research that you've uncovered. But it would be fun to see you playing again frequently as well. I mean. You, I don't. We, I, we just last week had an. Um, I interviewed what we call an adult improver, you know, a player in his fifties who's um, you made a significant rating jump on shoot. Um, and it's always fun to see uh, older players, older accomplished players, still battling and re- you know trying to trying to carry the torch for uh, against the the younger uh, hot shots. Well, I mean, on that note, I would point to uh, two players that are real inspiration to me, uh, both uh, octogenarians. One is uh, 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 international master uh, Anthony Sadie uh, uh, at the uh, National Open uh, uh, just a few months ago. He beat a 2,500-plus a uh, FIDE grandmaster at the age of 85. Wow. That's and incredible. It is, uh, and, and I believe that's a record. I mean, obviously, you know, he was never quite the player that uh, Korchnoi and Smyslov were. I mean, who who is? Right. But 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 by the early '80s, they they I don't I, I don't I can't think of anybody who's beaten a, a grandmaster of that level uh, at his age. I think that both Smyslov and Korchnoi, by the early '80s, had either stopped playing or were you know had really rapidly declined. I, but you have to check that with Korchnoi. Uh, the other person who really inspires me, and actually Sadie's 82, I think. But the person that uh, also inspires is uh, is 85, and that's Victor Pupils of uh, uh, Washington State. And he's played over 100 tournament games this year. Wow. And he beat uh, uh, I am uh, uh, Bryce uh, Tiglon, who did very well at the uh, – U.S. Open, he had like a real breakthrough event and almost qualified for the U.S. Championship. And uh, uh, Victor's beat him in the Washington State Championship, which is a round-robin tournament, earlier this year. And to put things in perspective, Pupils first played in that tournament in 1954. Wow. That's incredible. It is. It is. So, I mean, both those guys, I think, you know, know, obviously, as you get older – you know, you're you're not going to 
play quite at the level you did when you were at your peak. But I think if the motivation and the hunger are there and you still study and work hard on your game, I, I think good things can still happen. Excellent. Yeah. And since you're, since you're drawing from octogenarians, you're, you're in your early 60s, right? Yes. So yeah. you've, you've got a lot of time to ramp up. Yes, you betcha. <laughs> Excellent. So, so we'll look forward to that. And I, I understand that you've been sidetracked a little bit, so maybe this would be a better question to ask you once, once the Fisher book is published. But uh, in terms of what you would do in order to sort of, um, you know, resharpen your skills um, and, and uh, try, to, try to put your best foot forward playing, so w- what would your study regimen be? Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, one thing that, uh, is absolutely essential, and it's true for all players. Is you you really have to work on your chess skills. To that extent, I think that you uh, you need to solve a lot of tactics. I think if there's anything that all chess uh, teachers agree on and, and players do, it's that you need to uh, 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 you know you know spend you know at least you know half an hour, maybe an hour a, a day on tactics and. Uh, those could also be supplemented by uh, uh, trying to solve uh, in-game studies or you know or problems if you like. Uh, and there's a lot of materials out there now. I mean, whether you want to uh, study uh, uh, you know with an electronic device or you want books, there's just a, a lot of choices and a lot of good ones these days. What would be? What do you think your preference would be? Are you more of a tactics book person, or are you comfortable with the tactics trainers? I think I would do both, but I'm more uh, more p- paper oriented. Uh, but I think both are very helpful. And uh, uh, for uh, in-game studies, uh, I might even set them up on a board. I mean, uh, you know, I find those to be uh, much more difficult, and much more challenging. I mean, you know, usually most tactics I I can solve pretty easily. I mean, you know, even even more difficult ones I can do pretty well on. But uh, but in game studies, you know, are more forgiving, unforgiving, I should say. They just uh, you have to be very accurate and precise, and uh, it really requires you to visualize. And in terms of uh, doing tactics, do you? So you mentioned you can solve uh, most, or at least uh, run of the mill chess tactics. Um, do you feel uh, like as sharp as you ha- ever have, or do you feel like it's slightly more challenging than it used to be? Well, just judging from the uh, uh, tournaments that I uh, have played in this year, I played in a small tournament in Oklahoma, but there was like a, uh, I am uh, Patel, who's a very promising young player. He was competing in it, and I, I drew with him there. And I played in a, uh, a smaller tournament in Berkeley. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, there's definitely rust. And uh, uh, also, I can see that in the last uh, decade, the average level of play has definitely increased in the U.S. and uh, partly it's because of uh, you know all these kids uh, who you know are very uh, sharp tactically and usually you know pretty well prepared in their openings. Just the general level of opening knowledge has just increased tremendously. I mean, I used to enter you know 40, 50 games every week uh, from our Tuesday night tournament at the Mechanics, and uh, I started to notice after a while that you know even like you know, players are rated like 1,600 or 17, 1,800. Uh, they would play like, you know, a dozen moves of theory. Uh, uh, whereas I remember when I was starting out, you know, that was not the case at all. So that's really changed. Fortunately, they don't play the end games like, you know, like, you know, 2,400 players. Right. <laughs> it would be a real trouble. But uh, uh, but definitely that just – but in general, I would say that – there are just so many tools available now that uh, uh, th- 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 there's a there's definitely an upward trend. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to to seeing when when you get to play more. And um, you mentioned all the uh, the talented young American players. And and before we were recording, we were just discussing the World Cup a little bit. And it's nice to see. Um, you know, we're recording Thursday. This will be out Tuesday. But so it doesn't make sense to to break down the actual tournament too much. But it was certainly I, I was mentioning that we have three top three U S players in the top 10 and that's not including a car. Uh, when, so it's, um, it's, it's an incredible time. And, uh, it made me think of your, your, the work you've done as the captain of the Olympiad team. Um, so what's the, what's, um, what's the timeline for determining the U S next Olympiad team, the one that will be fielded next year? 
Well, the Olympiad next year will be in Hantimansisk. It's a small city that's in uh, uh, Siberia, not too far from uh, uh, the uh, Ural Mountains. And uh, this is, was the site for the uh, uh, 2010 Olympiad. Uh, this is where the World Cup's being played right now. Uh, this is the scene of a place that's held a lot of important chess tournaments, uh, both international and, and domestic. And it's uh, sort of a service center for the uh, oil industry in that part of Siberia. So it's a, a fairly prosperous town by uh, Siberian standards. Uh, and the uh, administrators in that region, they uh, uh, really love uh, chess. And uh, it's also an area, of course, it's being Siberia. It's cold, so uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, winter Olympic style sports like biathlon there as well. So they, they have built up a large hotel infrastructure that's disproportionate for a city of that size. So they can accommodate, you know, the 2,500 people that usually, you know, are coming to an Olympiad. So it'll be in Haunty and uh, the team will be selected immediately after the end of the uh, U.S. championship. And <clears throat> that would likely be, you know, say approximately in March. And what would happen is that uh, whoever wins the U.S. championship and the U.S. women's championship would automatically get a spot on the team. Um, of course, that's, you know, with all the, the, the players you just mentioned, uh, you know, that are rated three in the top ten and, and Hikaru, uh, and and of course uh, you know Sam Shanklin and Jeffrey Zhang being over 2,700 as well, uh, it's likely that <clears throat> probable I would should say that whoever wins the U.S. championship is probably somebody who's going to already make the team on by rating. But nonetheless, if you're champion, it doesn't matter what your rating is; you are on the team. Uh, after that, uh, the next five four players I should say are chosen by. Uh, uh, rating, and it's a formula. It's uh, uh, one component is your current USCF rating, that is at the conclusion of the U.S. Championship. One uh, uh, third of the formula is your current uh, FIDE rating, again at the conclusion of the U.S. Championship, and the third is a, a combination. It's your peak USCF and your peak FIDE ratings over the last 12 months averaged together. And then those three uh, parts are, are mixed together, and uh, the U.S. Chess Federation pulls out the, uh, makes a, a list of the players and then sends out the invitations. And then once the, the, the five players for each the U.S. team and the U.S. women's are selected, the uh, players vote on who they would like to have as their coach, and they vote on who they would like to have as their captain. And uh, I can say that this is not the formula that's used by uh, many countries in the world, uh, including many of the top countries. They have uh, selection committees or they have, uh, uh, you know, various, uh, like sometimes just one person. The, the captain, for example, is... is uh, 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 chosen and then he selects the team. But I like our formula. I think it, it's it's served us well. It's been in place since the uh, mid 1980s. I think it's uh, very transparent. It's very clear. Uh, you know, uh, I think that for a, a country like the United States that's so large and 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 has so many good players, that that it's it's the right way to do it. And I think also it's important that the players have the opportunity to select the captain and the coach they think uh, will do the best job to help them. Yeah, I, I, think it's a, I think it's good to not have human judgment involved, <laughs> just have a strict numerical formula that players can track. And then, um, and then uh, it's tougher to have grievances. Yes, I think it, it, it needs to be that every player feels they've been treated equally. And John, I somehow, I, I, it had escaped my attention until I was reading the most recent edition of Chess Life that you were on the uh, Sanford Fellowship Committee. So that must be um, a challenging job these days. I mean, I, I feel like uh, 20, 25 years ago, it might have been, it might have been challenging for uh, the opposite reasons, Ch hard to find a, a fully qualified candidate. And now I feel like there, it must be hard to just pick, uh, pick one or two players to, 
um, to receive this award. So how how does what are you able to say about how how the Samford Fellowship winner gets selected? And uh, I guess you, maybe for some listeners who don't know, you could explain what it is a little bit as well. Certainly, uh, 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 approximately thirty two years ago. Uh, uh, the family of uh, Frank Sanford, uh, who had recently passed away, they uh, decided uh, that they would honor uh, him by having uh, a, a fellowship in his uh, name. And uh, uh, this was uh, set up by the, uh, the family and uh, Alan Kaufman, he's a national master from uh, New York City, uh, and they set up uh, this uh, fellowship, so that every year there would be uh, 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 a fellow selected, and that this fellowship uh, could be for up to two years. And uh, the uh, people that have won it over the last thirty plus years are like a who's who of American chess, from uh, uh, Max Delugi, uh, Joel Benjamin in the early years come to mind. Uh, Hikaru Nakamura, Gadakomsky, Wesley So, uh, and more recently, uh, players uh, like Sam Sevian, uh, Jeffrey Zhang. Uh, uh, who else do we have that's currently on it? We've got. Uh, uh, just trying to think here. I'm, I'm, oh, of course, a Wonder Liang. Uh, there's like so many strong players now that at one point it was very common. And uh, that, you know, if you were an international master and you were, say, like 2450, you were a strong contender, if not the favorite, to become the uh, next Sanford Fellow. And now just raise that like, you know, I don't know, say 200 points, Fide, uh, and then you're, you're more in the ballpark. Uh, so the bar has definitely uh, risen. Also, the uh, people that are... Uh, uh, winning the award are uh, much younger, and I should say something. I mean, if you uh, uh, look at this, the fellowship right now, I believe, awards forty two thousand dollars a year. So every year you've got one new person being named, and then you have the fellow from the previous year uh, on his second year. So a total of of eighty four thousand dollars are given out every year, and this money is for uh, training. It's for uh, uh, travel to tournaments, for buying, uh, you know, very strong computers, um, you know, anything to do to help these players become stronger. And so in the course of the last 30 plus years, uh, uh, the Sanford fam family has given out, you know, well over, you know, especially inflation adjusted dollars, I would say probably in the neighborhood of two and a half million to three million dollars. So incredibly, incredibly generous thing for them to do. And they're, uh, you know, it's kind of under the radar in the sense that they're very low pro profile people. They don't, they just want to do a good thing and they, they don't need to get, you know, they're not asking for like lots of recognition for it, but it's, it's one of the great uh, stories of American chess. So being a part of the committee, um, it, it must be some tough decisions. Like I, I, I think this year um, the, there were co-winners, correct, with uh, Sam Savian and, and Christopher Yu. Uh, yes, and 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 uh, it's in fact I think uh, I'd have to look at it right now. But Jeffrey Zhang also might be like on his last. Uh, he may be he either just finished or he will. Uh, uh, or will be in the process of finishing. I think, oh, actually, no, right now it's a Wonder Leong, it's uh, Sam Sevian, and it's uh, 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 Christopher. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, the, the, what we're finding is that, uh, that the times have changed, that uh, first the expectation of what you're hoping for, uh, for the, uh, you know, the idea was always to try to find somebody that would, you know, you know, you know, ultimately, you know, you're looking for somebody that has potential to be world champion. If not that, a top 10 player. If not that, somebody who would be on the uh, U.S. Olympiad team that would, you know, contribute to uh, the very top level of American chess. And, of course, that bar has really risen in the last decade. And uh, and also, and, and, the, and the players, the caliber of players that are coming up uh, is not only stronger, but they're also much younger. Uh, so it's kind of a balancing act. You want to try to get them the money at the right time. Uh, 
you know, the, the resources for them to improve, you know, as quickly as they can uh, when they need it. Uh, obviously, you, you know, you could give it to somebody who, like was seven or eight years old, but it's, it's very difficult to project from there what they're going to be later on. And it's not clear at all that that would be the right time for them to receive the money. Uh, but we have uh, gone down in age in some exam in some situations, and that's partly in recognition of the fact that, you know, uh, most players uh, they're going to show what they they can show like within the first five to seven years of their when they start playing, and that seems to be pretty much, uh, you know, say they start playing at like you know eight or nine, uh, by the time they're like in their mid teens. Uh, you know, if they start to stall at that point, they're probably not going to get significantly stronger. They probably reach their 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 peak, and uh, it's it's kind of a sobering thought. But uh, there there's something to that. I think you know there are outliers. I mean, a good example would be Sam Shanklin. He is really the uh, the great story that you know if you continue to work hard on your game and and just keep at it, uh, you know, good things will happen. But he, I would say, is the exception rather than the rule. You know, these days, I would say if you're not 2,700 when you're like 21 years old, at a minimum, uh, you're probably not going to be a contender for the world title. That's just the way it is. You know, you probably have to be 2,700 when you're 18 or 19, actually. Yeah, it's it's sad. But that, I mean, not sad, sobering, like you say. Um, but, yeah. But that does seem to be what, what the data that we have suggests. Um, yeah, and it is tricky what you say about rewarding people when they're younger because someone like Christopher Yu, uh, he, I mean, he's he's on such a fast trajectory that and that it's on the one hand he's he's so young, but on the other hand, um, you you want to get the most bang for the buck, and um, you know he's traveling all over the world, so it's uh, I'm sure they could use the support. Right, and that's why we've divided the the you know so it wasn't kind of an all or nothing situation. Not put all your eggs in one basket and just back one player. And uh, uh, well, you can see, I mean, uh, Jeffrey Zhang uh, is is now twenty seven fifteen feet a. Uh, you mentioned that we have uh, you know three players in the top ten in Hikaru. Uh We also have two other players in like the roughly the top thirty ish. And that's uh, Jeffrey and Sam Shanklin. So that's six players over 2,700. And I would say we have like another dozen or close to that uh, that are over 2,600 feet a. So uh, the United States, uh, I mean, the situation is just, uh, you know, changed dramatically in the last decade. And, uh, you know, we not only have like a lot of real strength at the top, but we also have more depth and with uh, uh, Jeffrey and uh, Sam Sevian, we've got two of the top five players in the world, you know, under age 21. Yeah, it, it's it's incredible. It'll be fun to watch. Um, and do, do you think, have you thought as far ahead about, I mean, uh, I guess it, there won't be any big surprises, but who, who the United States' main competitors would be um, in the Open Olympiad? Well, the, the first thing to keep, it, keep in mind is that uh, – to win an Olympiad, you have to play very well, and you have to have a little bit of luck. I think personally that we played better in 2018 than we did in 2016, but we had a we had luck in 2016, and we didn't have the luck in 2018. Specifically, the one match against Poland, where we could have easily won that match, like three to one, and instead we we lost it two and a half, one and a half, and that was. You know, and then that ended up causing us to tie for first, and we lost the tie break instead of winning it. Uh, uh, the thing with the Olympiad is that you know it's only 11 rounds now. I say only because when I was first captain in 1986, it was 14 rounds. Later, it was 13. Now it's down to 11. I mean, they face the reality that they've got close to 200 countries competing now, and the the host country is responsible for the providing accommodations and meals. So it's just a question of economy. Uh, then the other thing is there's a lot more countries competing. When I first uh, was captain in Dubai in 86, there was probably a, a little over 100 countries. And now there's like 184, roughly, something like that, that showed up last time. Uh, you know, that's going to, you know, fewer rounds and more teams. It's going to make it, you know, a little bit more of a crapshoot. And 
Also, there's more strong teams. I would say in 1986, if you had a team with all grandmasters playing on it, regardless of their ratings, uh, you were probably seated in the top 10. Now you could have a team with all grandmasters, say they were average like 2,500. Well, you'd probably be like the 60th or 7th team in the Olympiad. So the 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 strength is just increased greatly. But in terms of the the top contending teams, I mean, uh, clearly, uh, you know, Russia and China are you know always right up there. They always have teams that are all players over 2,700. And the case of uh, Russia, even you know maybe even a, you know more like in the area of 2750 maybe for China in the area of like 2740 or so uh, but those are not the only other two teams that you know are, are really strong competitors uh, uh, you've got India which is coming up really fast now with uh, all these young talents but already they have uh, Anand and Hari Krishna and uh, 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 Vidit uh, so you know they've got you know plenty of, of of really really strong players, and then not far behind them you've got countries like you know Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, you know uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of of really strong teams. There's probably I would say in the neighborhood of maybe a half dozen teams over 2,700 FIDE. That's the, the FIDE takes the top four rated players on each team uh, for the average. And I would say there's probably an additional, oh gosh, maybe like 20 teams over 2,650. And, you know, so there's, it's, it's just a real uh, uh, a dog fight. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And, and what about away from the board? Do you have, so the first time you were captain, you said it was 1986. So what are your favorite stories from, from all the times you've managed to, to uh, attend these uh, historic chess events? You know, uh, I have a lot of really good memories. I mean, in, in general, the U.S. team is always uh, punched above its weight. I mean, we didn't always have all these players in the top 10. Uh, we would have teams where uh, they were much more balanced, where, uh, in the old days, you actually had two reserve players uh, to go along with the uh, four starters, and the six players would almost be, you know, within like ten or fifteen rating points from one to six. Uh, so they were more balanced, and and everybody would, you know, play above their uh, regular level. And so uh, the U.S. Is, has has done remarkably well. I mean, not just the last two Olympiads, but if you look over the last. You know, going back to the, uh, say, 1974, I would say would be when it started, uh, the U.S. has won a, a large number of medals. I would say, with the exception of the Soviet Union slash Russia, uh, we probably definitely are the second country uh, in terms of total medal count. And that's, you know, it wasn't like we were, like, you know, seated like 10th or 12th in these Olympiads, but but usually we were, like, seated like 5th or 6th, but somehow we would find a way to, to win bronze and uh, uh, but as far as like individual stories of some of the Olympiads, I would say that my probably favorite Olympiad moment would be uh, uh, Dresden in 2008. And uh, we had uh, played a very sort of uneven Olympiad. They had used uh, uh, accelerated pairings for this Olympiad, something they've never done before or since. I mean, in theory, it sounds good. You know, you have a huge number of teams. You have not so many rounds. So why not accelerate the pairings the first few rounds, get that over with, and, and then you'll, have, you know, save some time in terms of getting the, the top teams to the top. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to work so well for uh, team events as it does for individual. And so... Uh, we, I don't know exactly what happened, but we just got off to a really slow start. Uh, but then we caught on fire, a trademark of a lot of, uh, of U.S. teams, you know, that perhaps, you know, they're better adjusted to the jet lag and what have you. Because the U.S. always plays on the road when it comes to Olympia. We've never had one in, in uh, the United States. And uh, by the last round, we were scheduled to play against Ukraine. And we made up a huge amount of ground. But realistically, it looked like there was no possibility of us meddling. The Ukrainians weren't even thinking about us. They were just thinking about the Armenians who they were battling with for, for gold. Uh, but 
but somebody like you know some journalist had a you know there's a there was a free day before the last round and they had some time to kill and they decided that uh, they would just look and calculate what every team in the top ten or fifteen needed to have happen if they were to to medal and somewhere and they said oh yeah the United States uh, oh they have they have a clear path to meddling all they have to do is score three and a half a half against Ukraine and hope for X Y and Z to happen on the other boards. So, uh, you know, Ukraine outrated us by about 50 points on every board, and uh, uh, but but we we prepared hard, and the guys played, and they played really well, and we beat Ukraine three and a half a half. And uh, uh, you know, at, at a certain point, uh, Ukraine realized that they weren't fighting for the gold medals anymore; they were fighting for the bronze medals, and the team they were fighting against for those bronze medals was the United States. So that was a pretty dramatic moment. And I remember in particular, Goda Kamsky won like a really clutch game. He just uh, uh, destroyed uh, Vasily Ivanchuk. And Goda was like always like a really good guy for our teams. He always played really well. He was, you know, our our, our board one that, you know, for so many years. And he, he, he did 2000, the previous Olympiad in 2006, we had also uh, uh, won the bronze medals with him. Uh, playing for the team, and and we had won the uh, the world team championship in 1993 with him as well. So and, I would say that would be my top Olympiad moment. And there's more to the story, if I'm not mistaken, involving Ivanchuk. Is this the right the right it, year? It is. I'm afraid <laughs> that uh, the uh, uh, the FIDE uh, they have uh, uh, these uh, drug testers, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that in just a second, but essentially what they decided is they pre-selected individuals to test after the round. And you'd think that it would be make sense to wait until the uh, round was over and pick the winners because they're like going to be so happy that, you know, they're not going to mind the inconvenience of, of having to, you know, go through this testing procedure. But no, they did it the reverse. They, they, they selected Ivanchuk. Uh, and they did it before the round, and of course, here he was, he'd lost this horrible game, you know, where he just got crushed by Gata, and, uh, you know, he, and Ivanchuk's like a terrific team player, if you think he's good in individual events, he's, you know, which, which he's one of the greatest, uh, in team events, he even seems to rise higher, and he uh, was extremely upset uh, with himself for losing and, you know, for letting his team down. And he just wanted to get away from that tournament hall as quickly as possible. And, of course, all these drug testers uh, said, no, 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 we need to test you right now. And so he started running, and they started chasing him. <laughs> and uh, he was surprisingly quick, you know, good for Vasily. He managed to outrun them and dodge them. And uh, for a, a couple months, there was a, a question of what Fide was going to do to discipline him for evading the uh, drug testers, and uh, I must confess that I know of no drug that will uh, help you to play better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there are none. But the way it works is very simple. Uh, uh, chess is, has observer status with the Olympic body, and uh, uh, that means that uh, with it come certain uh, benefits and certain responsibilities. So, in theory, uh, chess could be in a position at some point to be part of the regular Olympic Games, but I think that extremely unlikely since they're always trying to cut back on the number of uh, events in the summer games and in the uh, winter games by charter it's required that they be played on snow or ice, which hmm. would be rather unpleasant for chess players. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, you know, they did have chess as a uh, uh, like an exhibition uh, sport at the uh, Sydney Olympiad. I think uh, Anand and Shirov played, but but other than that, I've never really heard anything like serious about chess being in the regular Olympics. But one fringe benefit is that a lot of countries, particularly in Europe, if you have this Olymp this Olympiad relationship with this observer status, you're eligible for funding for your national sporting body. So even a country like the Netherlands, you know, which is you know known for its uh, uh, you know not putting up with you know nonsense, you know that you know that you know normally the I don't think they would give uh, uh, drug testing the time of day, but uh, in this particular case, since they were getting a, a lot of money from their the Dutch National Olympic Committee for their, uh, you know, for their chess federation, you know, and uh, uh, they basically signed on to it. And uh, uh, 
And there's a lot of other countries like that that get money from uh, their national supporting body precisely because of this observer status. And I think that that's what sort of keeps uh, this relationship in place, even though it's you know, I, to my knowledge, nobody's ever failed this test. I don't even know if it's possible to, to fail it. Yeah. The only drug I can think, I mean, there's caffeine, of course, which is obviously legal, but it probably helps one's chest. Uh, at least uh, caffeine addicts like myself would, would be disturbed without it. But uh, Adderall, I guess, possibly could. I don't have personal experience with it, but I know that a, a lot of poker players take Adderall. So uh, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe that's the one thing, and I don't even know if that's what they're testing for. But well, one thing they're definitely testing for is caffeine, uh, and uh, the, the 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 situation there though is I think it's about the equivalent about eight or ten cups you would have to have in your bloodstream uh, to actually uh, cause you to flunk the test. But I'm not sure. I mean, coffee is a pretty strong diuretic, so I'm not even sure if you could ever get to that point, even if you chugged it really quickly, you know? I mean, yeah. and also, it's, you know, if you, nobody would drink that much coffee in such a short period of time, you get too jittery, I think, and, and it would be counterproductive. Uh, and of course, you know, you know, a lot of those products like Red Bull or, or you know, or, 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 or coffee, I mean, they, Aside from the fact that, you know, like at Olympiads, the bathrooms usually tend to be like, you know, a considerable distance from the, the board, which makes you kind of have to, you know, evaluate. Like if you're getting low on time, do you really want to put yourself in that situation? But, uh, you know, just it has, it, ha it has some positive effects, but it might have some negative effects also. It might allow you to focus better at one point, but maybe you, you crash at another point, you know. So... I, I, I've never heard of anybody, you know, playing dramatically better because of stuff like that. I, yeah. I just don't think so. I think it's electronic cheating that, that they should put the main emphasis on, and that's what they're putting it on now, and I think that's right. Good, yeah. That's uh, such a such a thorny issue. I mean, it's it's so hard to account for every possibility with electronic cheating. Yeah, they, but they do a pretty good job. I mean, I, I definitely had the sense that there was no funny business going on in the last two Olympiads. I mean, they uh, uh, they 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 have the screening as you enter the playing hall, and it's it's quite strict. I mean, even things like a like a uh, analog watch would not be permitted in just because they don't want to have to make the distinction that it, you know there might be an electronic watch that masks itself that looks like an old school watch. Uh, they uh, they supply the pens. The players are not allowed to bring in pens, uh, so they have a pretty rigorous screening process. Then they also uh, they uh, if you go to the restroom, a certain number of people are are screened as they leave the restroom area. Even though the restroom area is regularly patrolled, you know, I mean, they you know they they don't allow people to hang around. There's no spectators allowed in any area where the the players are. And at the end of the game, they also do, uh, they bring the players in and do some electronic, uh, you know, testing to make sure that they haven't picked up some tool along the way. And uh, they also, you know, use these these programs, you know, you know, like, with, the, you know, Ken Reagan and others have devised that, you know, I mean, if you play the first choice of uh, Stockfish 10, you know, for 40 consecutive moves, <laughs> right. they're going to look at you very funny, you know. Yeah, well, th that's good that that at least at the Olympiad there's um pretty good program in place. It sounds like. Um, so let's see, John. I have uh I have some more topics uh, here in my outline. Um, one of which is uh, I saw that your the your Rubenstein book um is now available on forward or books I should say along with uh, I am Nikolai Minyev, uh now available on forward chess. So. I uh, I took the opportunity of talking to you to finally read it, and I greatly enjoyed it. And we actually got a question from a supporter of the podcast uh, relating to uh, the great Rubenstein. So uh, the question is from FM Andre Tarakov, who asks, uh, he says, I really love the book on Rubenstein that you wrote with Nikolai Minyev. Um, and then he says, any chance of a third edition? Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, 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 Dr. Minev... Uh he was an international master, many times champion of Bulgaria, who made his home in the United States uh, from 1983 onwards. Uh, he's no longer with us. He passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, I really enjoyed doing this project with him. 
I didn't know much about Rubenstein uh, before I started it. That was back in the 1990s, and uh, since then, he, you know, he be- quickly became one of my favorite players. And uh, uh, what I would say is to a third edition is that uh, the first edition, well, there was like plenty of new ground to to break, and 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 it was a great pleasure to do so. Uh, for the uh, second edition, uh, there was still, uh, you know, I would say that like maybe 25% of the material was new and uh, it gave a chance to, to, you know, to correct some mistakes and, and there was plenty there. Uh, I've not followed Rubenstein's, you know, developments in the field uh, the last decade uh, so closely, but my impression is that uh, there's not a lot of new uh, information. I, I could be wrong on this, but uh, I've not seen like a lot of the, the games of his that are missing uh, that have turned up. Uh, I know that uh, there was supposedly a manuscript that uh, Lothar Schmidt had uh, that was stolen from his car that had a lot of Rubinstein games from you know like his early part of his career that uh, from from Poland that uh, were never published uh, and unfortunately this document was stolen from Schmidt's car and he didn't make up any backup copy of it and there's you know reasonable chance that whoever stole it was almost certainly not a chess player probably mm-hmm. just saw some squiggles and and just threw it in the garbage so short of that surfacing or short of finding like some something similar to that uh i just don't think that the games that are out there you know the games that are missing of his that they're going to turn up uh some things have uh, become a little bit clear uh, Michael Negley, who's a, a well-known German uh, chess historian, he uh, 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 was able to shed some light on Rubinstein's activities in uh, late 1912 and, and 1913. As you recall, 1912 was a banner year for uh, Rubinstein. He won four major tournaments. Uh, it was something uh, unheard of at the time. Uh, and, you know, just played brilliant chess. And, and that was sort of what sparked... Uh, the uh, motivation to have a match between him and uh, Lasker for the world championship title. Uh, But uh, after Rubenstein won those four tournaments, he didn't play for a while. I mean, he didn't play in uh, the end of 1912. He didn't play at all in in, in 1913. Now, to be fair, there weren't quite so many big tournaments in 1913 as there were in 1912. I mean, nowadays we have tournaments, you know, seemingly like, one every week, sometimes two big tournaments every week. But in those days, it could be months, if not years, between significant events. But but that said, it still seemed a little curious. And there was some thought that maybe uh, he uh, suffered from, you know, some sort of stress-related breakdown that, you know, obviously manifested itself later in his career. Uh, uh, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, it could be that he also was preparing to uh, uh, for the world championship match with Lasker, which was to take place in the fall of 1914. It could be he was training for that. Uh, but what Negley discovered was that uh, Rubenstein spent a fair amount of time in a place called Bad Reichenhall, which was a popular German uh, uh, resort. And uh, he was there in 1913, and, and, the, and the preceding autumn he was in... Uh, uh, area around Moran, also in a resort. And uh, what I, I don't know is if, uh, you know, people saw he was under a lot of stress and he needed uh, some time to, to kind of, you know, rest and relax, or if this was related to his training for the match. Seems a little bit early for the World Championship match, so I would be more inclined to think that, you know, he in those four tournaments he probably played about 70 games which by today's standards is really nothing. But if you take into account that like there were probably no short draws in those 70 games, and also, you know, opening theory wasn't as uh, developed it is, as it is now. I mean, I mean, certainly there was, there was opening theory, and Rubenstein was one of the guys developing it, but it, was, uh, it wasn't like you could rattle off 25 moves at the beginning of the game. So they had to think earlier and, and expend more energy earlier. So I would say that, you know, Maybe playing 70 games then was equivalent of like, you know, 125 now. And that would be a lot. And so maybe he did overdo it a little bit. You could understand why. I mean, there weren't that many good tournaments in those days. And you, you kind of try to grab them with both hands. Uh, so that's 
that's the only thing I really know that he uh, uh, that you know that's kind of changed since uh, we Nick Lai and I wrote the books. I do know though that that when he uh, uh, was at that Bag Reichenhall Resort, he did give a simul there. So that suggests to me that he you know that 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 the the demons that possessed him later on. I don't think they were still apparent then. I think that uh, he, you know, he was just feeling some stress and, and he needed to rest and relax. And and uh, uh, but on the other hand, you know, when he played in 1914 in uh, Saint Petersburg, obviously he didn't play at quite the same level. But but to be fair, also he had never played in a tournament quite like that where there were just the absolute elite playing and and not a a more mixed field of 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 top level players okay yeah that that sheds a lot of light i know it's uh what what happened to him in 1913 is a subject of some intrigue and he did have the the legendary work ethic uh you know uh said he studied what was it the uh, six hours a day, three hundred days a year. Pl- played sixty and took five days off, or <laughs> something like yeah. that. Um, and and uh, just to read the the second half of Andre's question, which you you answered some of. Um, I'll read the whole question, but mainly uh, if you could touch on on the very last part of this, which is so. Andre also wrote. Rubenstein is often mentioned in the list of players that had the talent to become a world champion. Ditto Kira is uh, going through. Rubens, Rubenstein's biography, I can't help but think that his delicate mental state was the main factor that prevented him from winning at all. Would you agree, or do you think that his psychological problems developed only later in Rubenstein's life? So you touched on that, but then uh, Andre also asked, could Rubenstein win at all if he had been given the chance to play the World Championship match in the early 1910s? You know, uh, that's a very good question, and I think that uh, uh, I think that his problems really i think the first world war didn't help his delicate psyche i think after the first world war i mean and the privations that you know he he went through i think that you know it was it wasn't going to happen it was it was you know he was not going to become world champion uh, the question is you know if the match had been played like say in 1910 or 1911 or 1912 would he have uh uh been able to take the title and one thing i should mention is that Although, you know, you have this impression of Rubinstein as this kind of fragile individual. Uh, that was really true later, uh, not in those years. And he was a terrific match player. I mean, just terrific match player. He beat a lot of really good players. And uh, uh, so I think it would have been a fantastic match. Uh, the one that they agreed to play in 1914 that was interrupted by World War I, it was going to be a 20-game match. So... Uh, you know, it would have been a real treat to have seen those games. Uh, and and I should say also that uh, uh, Rubenstein was really tested in matches. He had matches where he, he was trailing in the beginning and he came from behind uh, at the last moment. So, he you know, he was a very tough match player. But having said that, you know, I would have to say Lasker is Lasker. And... Uh, I think if uh, if any player of the great ones of the past is 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 a uh, you know enjoyed like a, a renewed appreciation in the last des- decade, I would say it's uh, Lasker, in part because of the uh, uh, book by uh, uh, Andy Soltis, and there's another one by John Nunn, and then this series by uh, Michael Nageli, uh, Ry Tishbirik, uh and there's a uh, another one that's partnering with him whose name escapes me, but those. Uh, uh, they, they've done like a three-volume uh, work on uh, Lasker that's really terrific. I mean, um, the guy, you know, I mean, nowadays we understand that a lot of these old, uh, you know, mis- misconceptions about Lasker playing weak moves on purpose and in, in playing indifferently in the opening that, in fact, uh, he was a modern player. I mean, a really modern player and and, and, and really great. And I... I would say that it would be a very close match, but I would have to say that Lasker would be a small favorite. Okay, well, huh? It's a, yeah, it's um. I know it's one of the, one of those debates, one of the many chess debates that that we'll, right. never, we'll never know the answer to. But yeah, and we'll... and in lieu of a, a third volume of Rubenstein, I would definitely I would give a a, a, a strong recommendation to two books by uh, Boris Gelfand. One's called uh, Dynamic Decision Making in Chess. Another one's called Positional Decision-Making in Chess. Now, both of these books are not 
per se about Rubinstein, but there's a large number of games in both of these books. Uh, I mean, Gell fans on record as being uh, a big fan of uh, uh, of Rubinstein, and and this is sort of uh, in part his uh, homage to the to you know to a, to his his great hero. Yeah, I, Rubinstein seems like one of those players who is. He he. Similar, maybe similar to what you're saying to Lasker. I, I as a when I was younger, I felt like I didn't hear about him as often as being one of the greats. But I feel like uh, no no grandmaster. He hasn't escaped the attention of many grandmasters. That we can we can put it that way in terms of us mm-hmm. studying the classics. Um, and and while we're on the topic of chess history, John, um, unfortunately, as as we mentioned earlier, last time you and I spoke, uh, we were you were able to reflect on William Lombardi a little bit, but this time we've had a, a few other recent passings in uh, American chess and chess history. So, I mean, first of all, uh, Shelby Lyman, what are your your memories of uh, Shelby Lyman? I, I remember 1972, and I remember, uh, you know, uh, you know PVS and uh, Fisher Spassky. And, uh, I mean, of course, by today's standards, it was uh, ludic- ludicrously uh, low-tech. I mean, they would have people running in the moose. The moose would you know, be delivered not on, you know, not in actual time. Uh, there were uh, no computer engines running in the background. Players would just uh, – uh, that – that were recruited to do commentary on the match with Shelby, they would, uh, uh, you know, throw in their comments. Uh, but it was charming, and it was really, I mean, uh, Shelby had a real knack, f- you know, for sort of humanizing the program, and it was good also in the sense that, uh, sure, it wouldn't have been so stimulating for your your grandmaster viewers, but that wasn't most of the people that were watching, and uh, he knew his target audience, and uh, he had... Oftentimes he'd have Edmar Mednos on there as a uh, uh, a guest commentator, uh, but uh, uh, but by and large, uh, you know, it was you know he knew there were a lot of people that had just come to chess, and uh, and he made it interesting for for a newcomer like myself, but it, uh, it wasn't dumbed down, and so I have very fond memories of that. And uh, uh, one one humorous thing about that is that uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, the Mechanics Institute for many years, uh, the late Steve Brandwine, who was uh, a very strong tournament player, but who uh, gave up uh, that aspect of chess uh, relatively early on, but was a even stronger, very strong uh, blitz player. Uh, he was on that world championship show in 72, and uh, they asked him about some position, and rather than answer the position uh, you know, give his insights into what was going on. He mentioned, uh, 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 you know, uh, shall we say, rather negative comments about Henry Kissinger, uh, <laughs> U.S. Secretary of State, and uh, I think it was like running dog Kissinger and uh, the evil one, uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, <laughs> they yanked him off the air so uh, pretty quick, but uh, he was a dear friend of Shelby's uh, uh, and, and remains so. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was it was an entertaining show. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, I, I've never had the chance to see it, but I mean, uh, the, it was fun to read a lot of tributes to the, to the effect that he had on everyone's life um, when he passed away. Um, yes. Did you ever get a chance to meet Shelby in later years? I did. I did. In fact, I actually, he was a good player. Uh, he played for the U.S. T- student team in Uppsala in '56. Uh, but I remember him from uh, some Bill Goichberg internationals. In the uh, late '70s, I pretty sh- I remember playing uh, uh, a Philadelphia International at, at one of the hotels in downtown, and it was it was a really unusual location because it was uh, it was near a suburban station, I want to say, in Philly, which is uh, one of the main railroad stations in the center of the city, and uh, uh, it was it was I mean, maybe it was not near there, but it was near the subways, but. Uh, every so often we would. It was it was not the quietest site. Let's just put it that way. But I remember Shelby playing in that tournament, and the late uh, uh, Geza Fuster, who's an international master, and uh, international master Carl Berger. All these, you know, chess lovers who, who passed away. And uh, I remember in that tournament also that uh, uh, one of the strongest players uh, in the history of American chess, not to become a grandmaster, was uh, Jack Peters. Of Los Angeles, and Peters was like rated over 2,500 f- feet a when that puts you like you know in the top 150 or top 100 players in the the world. And he 
uh, he had two GM norms, and he was playing Michael Walder, and if Walder drew, he'd make an IM norm. Of course, he later became U.S. champion and a grandmaster. Uh, uh, and if Peters won the game, he would become a grandmaster. And Peters was winning, but it ended up a draw. So he missed the GM norm by half a point. And then uh, Peters, uh, you know, he, he, he had... He had a, a young family. He had like two kids. He he was living in Los Angeles. He didn't really have the opportunity to travel, and uh, the norms then were uh, uh, just for like you know now they're for lifetime, but then they were for I think three years, and he just didn't really have the opportunities to to try to finish it off, and he missed the GM title that way. Hmm. And he was the the chess writer for the L.A. Times, right? Oh, for like twenty five years. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and very and one of the best columns in the United States we've ever had. Um. Yeah, and uh, and unfortunately, we have some other recent passings. Uh, chess historian Dale Brandreth, and of course, uh, uh, Pal Benko. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, everybody knows about Pal. I mean, you know, he was one of the the greats in so many ways. I mean, he was, you know, uh, uh, you know, twice a candidate for the world championship. He also. Uh, you know, you think of his contributions to opening theory, not just the Benko Gambit, but like a lot of lines in the English opening that he had his little uh, 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 innovations. Uh, and, and of course, also, you know, he's a world-class uh, problemist. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously he got in, inducted into the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame, you know, you know, right away. But in terms of, uh, say he had never played chess, he probably would have gotten in just for his problem composing. Hmm. You know, so he was, you know, and also he's just a terrific endgame player. I mean, just terrific endgame player. I mean, back in the days when they had adjournments, he was highly sought after, not for his opening preparation so much, but for his uh, his ability to uh, do a German analysis. And, uh, of course, you know, we also remember that he was the one that stepped down uh, and gave his spot uh uh, to Bobby Fischer for the inner zonal. Yeah. In that, 70. And is there in your, in your research about Bobby Fischer, there's been some people have said he was, uh, paid explicitly to do that versus paid versus paid implicitly versus not paid at all. And like, what do you think his motivation was? Okay. Well, I think his motivation was very clear. He wanted Bobby to play in that tournament. He knew, uh, that he wasn't going to qualify for the candidates, but he knew that Bobby was. So he wanted to give him that chance. Well, the thing to keep in mind is that Fisher, by the late 60s, was no longer playing in the U.S. championship. And the reason for that that he gave was that he felt that the tournaments were too short. You know, they were typically like a 12-player round robin. And, you know, 11 rounds, you know, you lose a game or two early on, you know, it's, it's hard to make that up. And so, in the case of uh, uh, Fisher, he actually had one U.S. championship where it was pretty close, where he lost, I think it was maybe 66, 67, or maybe it was the one before that. He lost to uh, uh, Robert Byrne, and he lost, I think, to Ruszewski back-to-back. And he only, I believe, won the event by maybe a half a point or a point. But... It was enough that it kind of got him a little bit jittery. Keep in mind, I think he only lost three games in all the U.S. championships he played, but he uh, he started asking that the U.S. championship be like 22 players, you know, the way it was in the Soviet Union, the way it was in Hungary. Uh, and his thought was by making it a much longer event, the, the the potential randomness of a shorter event would be would be eliminated, but of course there were a couple problems there. I mean, one is that all the players before the late before Fisher Spassky seventy two, you know, maybe Fisher and and Ruschewski were the only professionals. So typically they had the U.S. Championship uh, during the Christmas holidays, uh, and that could accommodate, you know. Uh, uh, a 12 player round robin without people having to take a lot of vacation time. Uh, but a 22 player tournament, I mean, it would go over like a right. month. Yeah. I mean, how would they make that time? Also, there wasn't that much depth at the top in U.S. chess. I mean, the top, you know, half dozen to maybe the top eight or nine players 
were very, very strong. But usually by the time you got to like, you know, number 10, 11, 12, you know, there weren't enough grandmasters to even, you know, to fill those slots. So I'm not sure that his idea of, of adding a lot of extra rounds would have, you know, you know, made such a, a a difference the way he thought it would. I think that, you know, the top guys would have just ended up beating all of them pretty much. Uh, so, and it, be that as it may, Fisher did not play in the 1969, 19, or maybe, yeah, it was 1969 U.S. Championship. Uh, it was won by Roshevsky, William Addison uh, was second, and Benko was third. So those three qualified to play in the uh, interzonal. As such, all three of them would have been given $2,000 to play, and that would have been money to compensate them for the fact they'd be taking a month off work, and because uh, the prizes in interzonals in those days were like, they were like ridiculously low. Uh, so, so if Banco had kept his position as a player, he would have received 2000 Instead, he offered uh, to uh, serve as a second and get his 2000 no So sense. he served as the second for Addison and Ruszewski in the Palma interzonal. I mean, Benko was a very correct person. And, uh, I mean, I don't think he would have, like, you know, it, it, he trying to, like, you know, just get, like, a, some money for, like, giving up his spot would have probably been the first thing from his mind. And so, but did Fisher, Fisher get the 2000 as well? Uh, no, Fisher got a different situation. Uh, uh, and, and I discussed that at length in, uh, in, in my, in the book Eric and I have written. And he, he basically, there were three parties. There was American Chess Foundation. There was the, uh, Piatgorsky Foundation, Jacqueline Piatgorsky. And there was U.S. Chess Federation. And the three were equal partners. And what Ed Edmondson, who did so much to help Bobby on his drive to the world championship did is he basically just said, Bobby, here's what we're going to do for your world championship cycle. In each event, uh, you'll receive uh, your uh, you know expense money, your airfare. Uh, we'll provide the fees for your second. Uh, we'll provide you with an honoraria for each tournament. And so Fisher got an honoraria. And I, I, I would have to look at, to see what it was exactly, but I'm sure it was at least 2000 if not more. Okay. So there was no extra money that needed to be come up with. It was just a matter. No. Okay. Um, interesting. And um, uh, John, are you okay on time to? to oh yeah, to oh, perfectly. To... Great. Um, sure. So you had mentioned. Did you know Dale Brandreth, the chess historian? Uh, I you... did. I I did, and I was very saddened, uh, but not surprised to hear of his passing. He had been in poor health for some time, uh, and with Dale's passing. It's almost the uh, the end of a generation of uh, great uh, uh, chess bookmen, chess booksellers, if you will. Uh, it it goes back to you know, I mean, you can go back back to like William Lyons before 1900, but I would say really modern U.S. chess uh, 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 book dealers uh, go back to Albrecht uh, Bushke, and Bushke was a uh, uh, a German uh, 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 book dealer and, and, and chess person who was an, a lawyer by profession in Germany, but with the rise of the Nazis, he found that he couldn't pack, practice his profession. And then he quickly uh, came to the realization that if he wanted to uh, live, it might be good to find a new country to uh, uh, move to. And he chose the United States. And he uh, had been collecting a lot of... Uh, uh, chess artifacts. He would routinely visit the uh, offices of uh, uh, some of the German chess publishers and uh, magazines, and they would throw away like their manuscripts after uh, uh, they published the material. And, and you know, they would be by well-known players like uh, Nimzovich or what have you. And uh, he said, "Well, you know, could I have those? I mean, I'll be happy to take them off your hands. You're just throwing them away." And he he started out from that, and he started collecting chess literature. And it turns out that you know, when it came time for him to uh, leave the uh, uh, Germany, uh, you know, the the Nazis that were uh, looking at what he had in his luggage saw all this chess stuff, and they said, "This rubbish," uh, but it was actually valuable stuff, as we well know. Right. And so it provided the uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
the 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 start for the uh, the seed money, if you will, for uh, what would become a tremendous uh, uh, a run as a, as America's premier book dealer, and he did that from like the nineteen uh, forties all the way up until the uh, uh, till his death in the late nineteen seventies, and of course, it, you know, he was based at eighty East Eleventh Street with the U.S. CF was, and there's that famous story about how Fisher, after winning his first U.S. championship, was uh, given like $100 in credit by Bushke, and rather than going in and just randomly picking out $100 worth of books, he very carefully thought about what he wanted to get over the course of the next year, slowly using his credit. Well, if Bushke was the first great book dealer in the U.S., uh, there were a couple others uh, that came after that, uh, John Rather and uh, uh, Oscar Shapiro, but by 1960, uh, Dale Brandreth uh, started to enter the scene, both as a publisher and as a, uh, a, a book de- dealer, I believe, by that point. And uh, over the course of you know the last 50 plus years, uh, uh, Dale did a huge amount uh, to preserve chess history, both as a, uh, a publisher of Caissa editions. He published many beautiful tournament books. Uh, Pasadena 32 would be one example. Uh, he published uh, some of the early works by uh, John Hilbert, our, our great chess historian from Buffalo. He uh, was just uh, uh, his book on Capablanca. He did with David Hooper on all of Capablanca's exhibitions was like a first-rate, uh, uh, you know, example of chess scholarship. He did uh, a, a lot, uh, but he also is probably best known for like uh, just selling. Uh, just uh, making available a huge amount of, of, of secondhand chess literature and uh, uh, particularly uh, foreign language material. He was uh, really uh, uh, the best of the best. Uh, and he he was so uh, enamored with it that he and his wife lived in the house in Delaware. And at a certain point, the house started to fill up. Hmm. And you know with what? Right. And he got, and it filled up so much that they had to move to another house. <laughs> and that second house only ended up, you know, having like a normal, you know, a couple thousand volumes of chess books in it. But the first house was filled up, you know, from just packed with chess material. Sounds and, like you had an understanding wife. Uh, yes, I would say so, and more. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So he was, and he just loved chess. I mean, and he he just loved being around chess books. I remember. The last time I saw him, I believe, was uh, there was a, a chess auction for the late Jack O'Keefe, a master from Michigan. It was held in Buffalo, and uh, all the collectors were there from uh, David DeLucia and Andy Ansel, and, and, and you know all the, the biggies were there. And uh, 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 Dale uh, 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 also was an active bidder at that auction, and he filled up a... Uh, a station wagon uh, to the brim with chess materials. And I should mention, he was also running the auction, uh, but he bought a lot of things in it. And uh, and then he, you know, he was not a young man. I mean, this was in the last 10 years, so he must have been maybe, he was in his late 70s maybe at the time. And, and then he had, you know, that same day he drove back to Delaware, you know, from Buffalo. I don't know, gosh, it must be eight-hour drive or something. It arrived in the early hours of the morning. So he was a true, you know, his chess book collecting readily ran in his blood. Wow. Well, I'm, and so I'm, on. Yeah. I'm glad that we, we're having you on at the right time to to properly memorialize him. Yeah. Now, n- there's only one person left now from that generation, and that's uh, Fred Wilson, uh, who's still going strong and, and knock on wood will be for a long time to come. He's only in his early 70s, so... I expect Fred to be around for another 20 plus years. He's in very good shape. And uh, if any of your listeners are in, in uh, New York, in, in uh, New York City, uh, he moved from 80 East 11th Street, but he's not far. Uh, he's just on the other end of uh, 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 the northern part of uh, uh, Union Square uh, on, God, this exact East 18th, I want to say it is, but I'm not positive. But it's easy to find me online. He's at Fred Wilson Books, but but he his his place brings back those sort of days of like you know a small space packed with a lot of really well chosen chess books, yeah. a golden space, if you will. Yeah, and of course Fred has been on the show, and also want to congratulate him. He made another USCF rating high for those uh, 
uh, who may have heard him reaching reaching the age of master uh, recently, around the age of 70. So it's great to see him not only uh, contributing to chess history with his uh, book collection and books for sale, but uh, but still still out there competing as well. Very much so. Um, so speaking of chess books, John, this is uh, the last topic I had on my list. Uh, for listeners looking for chess improvement advice, I would I would mention that John had some really good advice in our first interview. Um, so um, I feel like uh, you may have more to add on that, but I felt like it was spot on. I mean, you one thing you emphasized was the importance of competing, which I know you're you're gearing up and have been doing a little bit yourself, uh, but gearing up to do more. But I was curious. Um, I know you've been uh, busy with the Fisher research and with travel, but do you have any chess books you've discovered in the past couple of years or any that are you're, you're most excited to read, um, uh, whether new or old? Uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, question. First off, you would have thought, you know, a decade ago that uh, probably, uh, you know, you know, the, it looked like there was a time when uh, chess books uh, would cease being published, that everything would be uh, uh, digital. Uh but that's not proven to be the case at all. And uh, uh, what I can say before going a few specific recommendations is uh, I would say how many good publishers there are out there. Yeah. I would say there's more out there now than there were before a decade ago. Uh, I, I At the top of the heap, I would put uh, Quality Chess. Uh, it's pretty rare that you're going to run into a book published by them that isn't top-notch. In fact, I can't really think of any recent examples. You know, Chess books tend to be a pretty uh, individualistic, uh, uh, you know, materials. Some people like one book instead of another. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's sometimes a question of taste. But but in general, I would say that quality chess books from from top to bottom are are are, are always really a good selections. So that's one place where I always look when I'm looking for new chess books. Uh, there's a couple of. Uh, other European publishers, I mean, New in Chess, of course, has been around for a long time, but there's some more recent ones. Uh, there's one called uh, uh, Chess, I want to say Chess, Chess Evolution, and there's another one, I think it's, uh, uh, it's by Roman uh, Eduard. Uh, yeah. There's another one like Chess Publishing. Thinkers uh, Publishing is Thinkers right. Publishing. Thinkers yeah. Publishing. That's it. Chess Publishing is the online uh, opening theory, which is also quite interesting in its own way. But both those publishers are really good. Uh, uh, and in the United States, we have uh, uh, for those who have historical bent, there's uh, 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 McFarland, and there's also uh, uh, Mongoose Press, and there's also uh, uh, Hannon Russell uh, Russell Enterprises. Uh, as far as individual titles recently, one book I liked uh, from a, a company that doesn't produce so many chess books. Oh, and I should also mention Gambit in, in, in England has also produced a lot of titles just recently after sort of a hiatus. Uh, but uh, one publisher that used to be like the undisputed king, I remember back in the early 1970s, was uh, 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 Batsford. Right. And, and then – they went through a lot of different, you know, recon, you know, they went out of business or they went under different names, but, but the Batsford's still there. And, uh, uh, you know, they published a, a couple of really good books by Andy Soltis. Uh, but another one I liked just recently is called uh, 300 Most Important Chess Positions. And it's by a, a Swedish international master uh, by the name of Thomas Inkvist. And so, some people might remember him. I think he did the book on Leonid Stein, and he might have done the book on Petrosian as well for uh, Quality of Chess. Another, or not, no, it's uh, what is the name of that company from England uh, uh, that has like Move by Move? Uh, my memory's escaping me here for just a second. Uh, uh, it'll it'll come to me in just a second here. But uh, this book, uh, 300 Best Chess Positions, uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, the idea is that uh, Enquist, when he was a young man, he uh, and some of his fellow young club mates, uh, they would meet up every week with uh, this one chess instructor, and he would show them five positions. And it could be something, you know, like... Uh, uh, Lucina's position or rook and pawn game. It could be like some sort of king and pawn game with a uh, triangulation. It could be uh, 
uh, some typical middle game motif, but he would always show them like these five positions, and uh, they would go over them very thoroughly, and the test of the student's mastery of the subject would be that they would be able to teach this position to somebody else. And the idea would be that uh, these would, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, key core positions that, that would be, you know, essential that would always stick with them, that they wouldn't be like some opening theory that would, uh, you know, that would be constantly changing, but would be information that would be always useful for them and would always be uh, material they could readily apply in their games. And so he set up uh, 300 positions uh, here that he thought that were appropriate. I think there's like 100 from the opening and 200 from the middle game and end game. And uh, I think he did a really good job. And uh, it's a very reasonably priced book. I believe it's under $20. Uh, so it's by day-to-day standards, it's like a steal. Uh, so that's one book. Uh, and by the way, the uh, the company I was thinking of, it's Every Manchester yes. in England. Uh, and uh, they published a lot of really good books. I mean... Any book that's written by John Ames, I can usually give a you know unconditional recommendation uh, for. He's done a really lot a good. I mean, his survival guide to rook and games, uh, the two volume series, uh, Simple Chess, are both really good. Uh, and uh, uh, Inkfist also published, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, the the book on Stein. And I think let me just check here real quickly. And I think the book on Petrosian. Yep. also by him as well. Uh, so he's done some really good work. So he's starting to become a favorite author of mine. Uh, uh, as far as other books, I think the uh, uh, specific titles, I, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by this uh, book, The Woodper- Woodpecker Method by uh, uh, two uh, Swedes uh, that's published by uh, uh, Tekanen and uh, uh, Smith, it's uh, published by Quality Chess. That looks, it's a, the idea is that you, uh, you have like, you know, 800,000 positions and you, uh, you try to uh, solve them. You, you, you do as well as you can the first time around, then you try to solve them the second time. And the idea is to uh, just sort of develop so it's almost like finger memory, that these sort of uh, uh, combinations become like uh, second, uh, uh, like just like breathing, if you will. Uh, so I think that uh, that's another book that's really struck me as uh, as a good one. Uh, and another book I found quite interesting. There's a recent book by uh, Russell Enterprises, and it was like on Petrosian and the King's Indian. And uh, I forget the name of it. It's a Russian author. Uh, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of books on Petrosian, you know, and it kind of like, and a lot of good ones, but sometimes the materials kind of seems like it's pretty familiar. It's sort of been recycled. Uh, uh, but this book, I, I, doesn't suffer from that fate. And what he's done is he's, uh, selected all the games where Petrosian played, uh, against the King's Indian and played it himself. And he, uh, has a lot of interesting things to say. You might think that the book would be kind of, uh, uh, useless as far as, opening theory goes, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that assessment, but where it's really strong is it, it shows like um, Petrosian's understanding of a lot of typical middle game positions in the King's Indian, and uh, you know, of course the Petrosian system in the King's Indian uh, gets a fair amount of attention, but other structures do as well, so th- I, I really like that, and I was also surprised uh, t- to see one that Petrosian played the King's Indian a lot more often than I thought he did, and two, how successful he was with it. He usually only brought it out when he really needed to win with Black, uh, but he was really uh, 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 quite, you know, I mean, he really just understood the King's Indian, no matter which color he was, and particularly the structure with uh, where Black plays, uh, you know, White has pawns on, on C4, D5, and E4, and Black has pawns on C5, D6, and E5, like Magnus played against uh, uh, the young German uh, earlier this year. Uh, Petrosian was very good in that structure with Black, and, and they have quite a few good games. So I would say that if you're, uh, if you're looking for a book to sort of complement uh, your, uh, you know, your, your King's Indian player, or you play it as, as White against it, uh, and you're looking for uh, a book to sort of like familiarize yourself more with uh, middle game motifs in the opening, I would say that's definitely a, a good read. 
if you want to study more like tactics that crop up in the King's Indian, there's a book out uh, by uh, oh gosh, it's it, it, there's so many books coming out today. Yeah, this one's amazing. by Quality Chess, and it's uh, I think it's Espen Lund and uh, uh, a, uh, a another Nordic grandmaster. But that's kind of interesting because the idea, you know, it's this concept that's so popular today. You know, that what players need is more active training, not not to just passively book, read books, but to sort of chew them and digest them, and and to really engage with them. Uh, this idea of like you know solving lots of, of, of exercises uh, is the way to go, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, that book could be a good one as well. Excellent, yeah. And I did look up the author of the King's Indian according to Tigran Petrosian. It's uh, Igor Yanvaryov. It looks like. Does that ring a bell, John? Yes, that's exactly that's exactly it. Okay, and for the quality chess book that you just mentioned, I'll, I'll track that down later. And as I did, as I always do, uh, we'll have links to everything that John has mentioned because uh, it's like drinking from a fire hose, John. It's hard, hard to keep up as as with uh, reading chess books, as with uh, talking chess with you. Um, and one one thing I just wanted to add about the uh, woodpecker method, I know it has practically a cult following online. It's now available on Chessable, and I, I, I people just swear by it as one of the most efficient ways to to improve at tactics um do what what rating level do you think that would be appropriate for john you know that's a good question and i think uh, it, it opens up a, a broader uh question which is uh, you know how do you pick out tactics books that are appropriate for you because there's so many books out there whether you call them tactics books or puzzle books or what have you and i would say that uh, for players up to like you know 1800 or 2000 uh solve, just solving tactics themselves is maybe not the right way to go i would say that you want to sort of divide your 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 time in, in into two parts one would be solving lots of tactics but also you need to get your hands on a book that will explain to you the very basic tactical themes and there's there's a fair number of good books out there i remember like a book by like a I think it was like by Boykov and Gorgiev. Uh, there was a, works by uh, Dr. Minev. There's there's a, there's a couple, more than a couple that are out there that basically just teach you fundamental chess tactics. Uh, and then you know you got that on one side, and you're then you're just solving lots of puzzles and and and, and going through them. I, I think just going through the the puzzles might not be as beneficial at that rating category because you need some sort of foundation to kind of orient yourself. But then say you get over like 1800, you get to like 2000. Uh, there's still like a, like a huge number of books on tactics. I mean, probably it's not so surprising because, you know, that's the one area where everybody agrees it's, it's beneficial. Uh, that's trickier. And I think that, uh, one thing you need to do is if you're at if you have access to a bookstore like a Fred Wilson or or you're at a tournament, you know you could kind of peruse what's available, try to solve like ten of them, and if you find that you know you uh, got through them super quick, well probably that book's not challenging enough. If if on the other hand you uh, you, you went through all ten of them and uh, you know there was a book by uh, Volek Keaton Grabinski. Uh, that was like really at the high end, you know, this would be not the right book for somebody that's like 1,800 or 2,000 to work through, or at least they should realize in doing so that it's really tough going. Uh, you know, you, 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 you need to make sure that, you know, if you can't get like, you know, if you're really applying yourself and you can, can't even get like 50% of them right, then it's probably a little too tough. Something to come back to maybe later on when you are a more advanced player. Uh, so, uh, if you don't have access to, uh, you know, a chance to preview the book, if you will, that's one of the great benefits, like of being a member of something like the Mechanics Institute uh, Chess Club, is they have this huge library. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, most publishers nowadays they offer uh, PDF excerpts, you know, of a small portion of the book, and uh, that should probably give you a pretty good idea if it's at the right level for you. But in, in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, woodpecker method, uh, I've not yet uh, partaken of it. Rather, I just sort of perused it. But like most quality chess books, I would say it's geared towards the higher end. 
Yeah. I would say that I would say maybe two thousand on up, maybe twenty two hundred on up, with the caveat that that's not to say that players that are say like eighteen hundred to two thousand uh, wouldn't benefit from it. Uh, if they're willing to apply themselves and also realize what they're getting themselves into, right. uh, you know, but it's definitely not the book for say somebody that's like 1200, not at all. Okay. All right. Well, excellent advice, John. And, uh, I think, um, um, I've covered everything for, for now, uh, that, that I had on my list. Is there anything else you'd like to, to mention before, uh, we, we let you, um, face the day? Are you sure? Um, Two things. One is uh, just a short uh, thing. I mentioned uh, two books by Gelfand for people that are interested in, you know, uh, you know, fresh Rubenstein material. Another book that's a little bit older that I can also give a very strong recommendation to is Learn from the Legends by uh, Mihai Marin, who's a great author. And that has a chapter in Rubenstein and Rook and Pawning games in it. So I can give that a strong recommendation. And then the other thing I thought I would uh, make a mention of is uh, everybody uh, – knows about the U.S. success in the, uh, you know, 2018 uh, Olympiad. We tied for first. We lost on tiebreak to the Chinese, but it was a great result. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, and, 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 and it's, due, it's received its due. But uh, I would also point out to the performance by the U.S. team in the World Team Championship in Kazakhstan in 2019. It was held this last past March. The tournament was organized on extremely short notice, six weeks, with a result that most of the top American players had already made prior commitments. And so we didn't have any of the big guns, you know, uh, Icaro, uh, Fabiano, uh, 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 I'm not sure if Lanier was eligible at that point, but I think he was. But, but again, he had other commitments and uh, also Wesley. So those four were out. Sam Shanklin had already had a signed contract to play in Prague. He desperately wanted to play for the team, but he just, you know, he said, I signed a commitment. I, I, I've i got to honor it. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Zhang, uh, uh, Ray Robson, who's played on five of our national teams, uh, both of them had commitment to play in St. Louis, added, as did Varjan Akobian. All this overlapped. It was like the worst possible time to have the world team. So we ended up going, all, I think, the invitation list went all the way to number 15. So they were joking, you know, when the uh, when we arrived in, in Astana, the capital of uh, Kazakhstan, the U.S. didn't send its A team. The U.S. didn't send its B team. The U.S. sent its C team. What can these guys hope for? Well, we answered that fairly quickly on when we beat China, wow. you know, defending uh, Olympic and, and world team champions. And... Uh, 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 we beat them because uh, Alex Lenderman uh, won his individual game and the, our other three players uh, drew. But the team was uh, a very good team. Uh, we had uh, uh, Darius Swears uh, on board one. We had uh, Sam Sevian on board two. We had uh, Alex Lenderman uh, playing for us. We had, uh, on, he was, I believe, uh, our fourth player. We had Alex Onershuk on board three. And then we had... Uh, on uh, reserve player uh, was uh, Zviad Azoria. And everybody on the team got along really well together. We had really great team a atmosphere. And that compensated uh, to a considerable extent for, you know, some of the firepower we were missing. And we also had uh, Elshan Morabadi was our, uh, our coach, and he did a really terrific job at preparing the players. And uh, uh, Darius and... Uh, uh, Sam both went undefeated on boards one and two. Uh, both of them uh, made their, you know, uh, in the case of Sam, he, he, from that performance uh, and, and other ones around that time, the U.S. championship included, uh, he, he jumped into the top 100 players in the world. Uh, uh, you know, both, you know, Darius and, and Sam were like around 2675. I'm not sure where they are precisely right now. But what it shows is the great depth of American chess. Also, Alex Unashuk, on what was probably his last time playing for the U.S., he broke the record held by Yasser Sarawan and held by uh, uh, Larry Christensen uh, for uh, 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 most times playing for the U.S. national team. Both of them, uh, uh, both of them, uh, uh, had played 12 times for our Olympiad and World teams, and this was Alex's 13th time playing for the United States in a streak going back to 2004. Wow. So it was really a, a very impressive and a really great 
performance. And uh, our U.S. women did very well in that tournament. They were captained by uh, 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 Melit Kachian and uh, with uh, Alejandro Ramirez as the uh, 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 coach. And uh, they, like the uh, 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 open team, uh, were... Uh, Handicapped by the fact that the U.S. Championship was going to start in uh, less, I think, four days after the World Team ended. So, you know, understandably, most of the players, you know, who weren't professionals couldn't couldn't play in both events. Uh, but still, they did really, really well. And uh, uh, I would make a special uh, shout out to the uh, performances of uh, Carissa Yip and uh, to Ra- Rochelle Wu. And Rochelle became, they did very well in the event, and Rochelle became the youngest player ever to play for the United States. She was 12 years old. Hmm. Wow. And she, uh, 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 you know, uh, played, played very well in her debut. And she also, it turns out, is, is probably the most flexible player ever in the history of American chess. And when I mean flexible, uh, she and Carissa had some uh, interactions and uh, uh, at one point uh, Chris said, said uh, I'm more flexible than you and Rochelle said no I'm more flexible than you and then Rochelle did a, a split in which uh, you know like a gymnast gymnast would have been, you know uh, would have been proud and uh, I realized that uh, our national teams are changing <laughs> yeah and Carissa yep now over 2400 feet I just just making incredible strides um we we talk a lot about future future world champion contenders and uh she's she's in that category as well i mean uh good good time to be an american chess fan very much so i mean i would just end with saying that you know a decade ago there were no us girls on the under 21 you know list uh, top, for the top 100 for fide and now we have like a dozen so yeah you know, so it, 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 you know, on, uh, for both the boys and the girls, um, we've got a lot of talent coming up, and a lot of good coaching, and uh, you know, a lot of good tournaments for them to play in, whether it be in St. Louis, of which there are many, or or you know, around the country. Uh, we definitely, you know, knock on wood, things are looking good. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so it should be exciting. Well, John, I, I wish you good luck with your your semi retirement. <laughs> um, and thanks again for coming on. It's always so much fun to, uh, to, to hear your stories and get, get your perspective. Well, thank you very much for having me, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Most of all to my producer, Matthew Passy, but also to everyone who helps spread the word about the show. That can be by telling a friend, by writing a positive statement on Twitter or Facebook or whatever your preferred social media outlet is, by writing a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform. All of that stuff helps. But most of all, I want to thank the people who provide financial support to the show. Without you all, the show would not be possible. So here we go. Thanks to my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Partners. I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Handelman, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber. I am Dimitri Schneider, Greg Nat- Tell. I am Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jen Screen, John Jernick, and John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chest, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, the Mysterious Moon Master 9000, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant, Todd Kennedy, and I'd like to give thanks to Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howardland, Brett Zeldo, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri. Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Selecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Day's Chess Academy, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Evan Sagers, I am Alec Donny Ariel. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, GM Josh Fidel, newly minted IM Kare Christensen, 
WGM Katerina Namsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reiforth, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Miguel Araspidi, Mr. Michael Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, WGM Tati of Abrahamian, Thomas Stanix, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Kolmanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you guys soon.